podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people? That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to to smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. You know who it is. You know what we're doing here. Thanks for joining us. I hope you're excited today to learn something new, something useful. You can implement it now and it can probably change your life. I, I really do mean that. We are interviewing Amy Herman. And Amy is the author of Visual Intelligence, Sharpen Your Perception, Change Your Life. Now, as I said that, I want you to think about everything I just told you within the past 20 seconds. You started creating these images, these thoughts. Who is Amy? What has she done? What does she look like? What is visual intelligence? Sharpening my perception. Oh, I've heard of that before. The reason I'm bringing this up, it kind of kind of dovetails nicely into what Amy talks about, which is we go into situations with all these preconceptions that we don't simply observe, ask, think, and articulate, right? We, we come in so loaded. Well, what do we then miss out on? And that's what visual intelligence, or at least partly that's what it's about. This book comes directly from Amy's groundbreaking, the art of perception course And it teaches doctors to observe patients instead of their charts. It helps police officers separate facts from opinions when investigating crimes. And it also, there's folks like the FBI, State Department, and Fortune 500 companies and businesses learn how to recognize the most pertinent and useful information. Amy was previously the head of education at the Frick Collection in New York City. And she now brings this work and her course to a wide range of organizations and institutions at local, state, and federal levels, as well as for-profit companies. She holds an AB, a JD, and an MA in art history. Her work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, CBS This Morning, NPR, etc. By the way, AB, JD, MA, that's a lot of things after your name. But she's well-learned and very smart and comes across not just in this interview, but also in her book. If you enjoy the podcast, if you listen, if you binge, if you pick it up every now and again and feel like you get something out of it, there's two things you could do that help us. One is leave a review on iTunes. I know many people think, oh, you know, I'm not going to do that or whatever. It takes about 30 seconds and you'd be surprised at how much it helps. It kind of gives that social proof to the world. Hey, check this out. It's worth it. So I'd appreciate that. Also, sign up for the newsletter if you go to smartpeoplepodcast.com, bottom right-hand corner. Why is that so important? Well, we have another upcoming webinar. These have been so great. People are asking questions. They're getting on there. They're talking directly to the experts. Where else can you do that? And additionally, where the podcast is an interview, these webinars are presentations put on by experts that people pay thousands of dollars to go see. And they're all about the how to, how to build better teams, how to be more creative, how to succeed in business. These are just some of the topics we cover. And to add one more to it, we will be having a webinar in a few weeks with recent guest, Patrick McGinnis. Patrick was on episode 240. So just the last one, if you haven't checked it out, definitely do it. The title of that was live your startup dream without quitting your day job. Patrick wrote a book called The 10% Entrepreneur, which is all about that. It's really some of the best advice, I think, about going from a day job, a corporate job, to the life you want as an entrepreneur, if that's your thing. So now, Patrick's going to teach you how to do that. We haven't officially nailed down the date. I know it's going to be within the next three weeks max, so we don't have a formal sign up, but if you want to be notified, one of the only ways to get that is going to be the newsletter. So again, smartpeoplepodcast.com, bottom right-hand corner, newsletter sign up. That's it, guys. It's time to give you the goods. Here we go with Amy Herman as we discuss visual intelligence. Enjoy. Enjoy. 
Amy, thank you for so much for being on the show. I know we were kind of just talking a little bit. Um, I had a chance to get through most of your book. I just got it. And I think this information is is almost critical for anyone and everyone. So I can't wait to get into it. And thank you again. Oh, my pleasure. Happy to be here. So first I wanted to, as my listeners know, I, you know, we're going to be talking about visual intelligence and that's the book you wrote. And we're going to get into that. So you are, what do you call yourself now? Like a scientist or what are you? (laughs) (laughs) I wear a lot of different hats. Um, Somehow educator doesn't seem to do it. Consultant doesn't seem to do it. My background is that I'm a recovering attorney and an art historian. Mm. And I've taken, I like to think that I've taken the practical aspects of each of those disciplines. And I've put this amalgamation together, this art of perception program that brings the best of the disciplines of legal analysis and visual thinking and bringing it together in the art of perception that seems to be applicable across the professional spectrum. Wow. You've never practiced that before, have you? I mean, come on. (laughs) You know, it changes every time I say it because every class that I do informs the next one and Mm. it's it's constantly evolving how I think of it. That's very, it's a good point. I I, actually, you touched on something there. I read that you used to be a lawyer and I have this really interesting, I don't want to necessarily call it an opinion, but so I've met a ton of lawyers. I used to work at a financial firm where we were attached to a law firm. And so I'd go to the gym with them and all that. And I have uh-huh. two things to say. One, I've in my life, I've met two happy lawyers out of probably a thousand. <laughs> right. And what is it that seemingly makes intelligent people first want to become lawyers and then go, wow, why did I just do that? Well, I should start by saying that I really admire my friends who are lawyers and love what they're doing. I never got there. So they exist? Uh, lawyers they that love exist. what they're doing? Okay. <laughs> Or at least they admit that's what they admit to. (laughs) Uh, I knew, and something that I talk about in the book a lot is your gut instinct. And I knew within the first six weeks of law school, this was not going to be the trajectory for me. But when you're six weeks into law school, I had studied art history undergraduate. I wasn't sure what to do. So I think to answer your first question, why do a lot of intelligent people go to law school? They don't know what else to do. Mm. And they think there'll be value in a legal education. Mm. And to that point, I really can't argue too much. It was a valuable experience. I really didn't like it very much. But it taught me to think in a way that, that no other discipline really had before. So I got out of law school, still didn't know what to do, and realized that the value of a legal education um, you only get a net return if you if apply. If you go into law, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so I practiced law for about five years. Again, didn't like it. And going into year five, I said to myself, "I can't do this the rest of my life." I didn't have golden handcuffs. I didn't have a mortgage. I didn't have kids. And I thought, I just can't do this. We spend too many of our waking hours working, and this is miserable. And so it took me about two years. I said, there has to be a museum somewhere in the world that wants to hire a lawyer, and, but not as a lawyer. And I got my first job here in New York City at the Brooklyn Museum. And I'll never forget, I came out of the subway that first morning. And when you come out of the subway at Eastern Parkway, I looked at this giant edifice and my heart sang. I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to work here. Mm. And I never looked back. I gave up my apartment, my car, my worldly goods, moved to New York and started a career in the museum world. And it's all been fast forward since then. And, you know, I can almost I can hear my younger self going, wait a second, wait a second, for so many reasons. Like, first (laughs) of all, so you just had this aha moment and that doesn't necessarily happen for everyone. And You know, it all sounds like it worked out, but really, I'm sure between law school and the years after that and figuring out what you wanted to do and the debt you had was actually pretty difficult. Not only was it difficult, it was circuitous. I mean, I, you know, I have college students who write to me now all the time and they say, I want to do what you do. Mm. And I said, you know, it took me a long time to get here. The aha moment for my passion came in college Mm. in an art history class when my professor put two Rothkos up side by side and they took my breath away. And I thought, somebody painted those and I want to know all about it. But it took me a long time to get there because as you said, I had debt, I have bills to pay, I have a life to live. And, you know, to put two careers together, to have a background in law and convince someone that you really want to work in the art world, it took some creative thinking and it took some good opportunity and a lot of hard work. (laughs) I cannot emphasize enough talking to people in contacts and informational interviews until you get to the right place in the right time and you make the most of that opportunity. Wow. 
I couldn't agree with you more on that and couldn't be said better. So let's leave leave it at that. Now, I did want to say, you know, a lot of what you talk about in in your book, I mean, really a lot of the purpose or I don't want to say purpose, but the idea behind it is individuals experience things individually. Like yes. people are their own person and you kind of talk about it in the visual sense. But I, what I found fascinating right there is you said this thing about art history and I couldn't I. I I could tell you that there is nothing I'm less interested in than art history. Uh-huh. And 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 look, I mean, you know, that is what it is. I'm sure there are things I like you don't. But the point is, you were willing to say that's my thing and major in it, which who knows where the career path goes. <laughs> and and it just shows that like people have different things that they like. They should follow them to some degree. Any advice or thoughts behind that? Absolutely. I think that um what happens is I meet a lot of people, I would say 99.9% of the people who take my program and participate, not only have never studied art, many of them can't stand art, right. and many of them have never been inside museums. And what I say to them is, I'm using art as data for you. It's my love and my passion, but I know that you're not looking at art every day, but there's value in it for all of us. Mm-hmm. And I feel quite fortunate that I have found something that... I just love to look at, I love to think about, but I recognize that the rest of the world doesn't see it the way I do, and it's my job to connect the dots. It's my job and my creative thinking to say, I'm going to take this new set of data that you've never seen before, I'm going to make it relevant and applicable for you, and when you're done with my session, you're going to walk out the door thinking differently about my job. You may or may not think differently about art, and frankly, I don't care about that. I don't need to convert anyone to be an art lover. But I'm making it practical, and I'm going to help you do your job more effectively, whether you're a surgeon, a police officer, an intelligence officer, a nurse, or a teacher. And I recognize fully that not only do people not like art, most of them don't know anything about it, and that's just fine. Yeah, and I should have prefaced it with this. I kind of felt safe telling you, you know, I don't really art history and art in general, because because I went through your book, and... A, I understand how you use it to tell a larger story, how you use it to really explain this whole idea of visual intelligence. And it does kind of I started having a I wouldn't say, I, you know, I love it more and I want to, but a new appreciation for what just the the uh, visual intensity of art can provide anyone. You know what I mean? You know what? That's that's exactly what I wanted to achieve in the book. And in yeah. fact, I just came into my building and my doorman stopped me in the lobby and he said, I'm three chapters into your book. I'm loving it. And I would have never picked up a book like this. Wow. He said, I never thought that I could look at art and have any questions about it and think about it. And he said, you opened my eyes and I didn't know they were closed. Wow. <laughs> that's a really powerful statement. <laughs> That's what I hope to do with most of my readers. Nobody thinks their eyes are closed. And I'm hoping after reading this book, they're going to say, wow, maybe I'm missing something. Well, I'll tell you. So let's get into it. One of the scary things here is you do point out what we're missing. And in my case, I feel like there's so much incoming all the time, so much opportunity now that I enjoy things that I'm doing that and and I'm tired often because there's so much going on, I think. I can't pay more attention to more things like I I kind of like being on autopilot sometimes. And then I got scared. What am I missing? Do you right. hear that from people? I hear it all the time. Mm-hmm. And if you saw one of the caveats in the book, I talk about autopilot. And the next sentence says, turn it off. Mm-hmm. The problem with autopilot, it's sort of how we have to live our lives. We have a routine. We do certain things every day. And autopilot makes it easy for us. We don't have to think about everything. But the danger in relying on that autopilot is things that are going to be out of the ordinary, we're going to miss them. We're going to miss them. And the example that I give in my class all the time, it's not in the book, Uh, Years ago, when my son was in elementary school, we live on the east side of New York, and I would take him to the West Village to drop him off at elementary school. And coming home one morning, I was jogging on 12th Street, and a man came out of a building in a wheelchair, and he had a rope tied around his ribcage, and he was walking the cutest puppy in the whole world. And I said to him, can I pet your dog? And he said, of course. Got down on the ground. I played with the dog, stood up. I went my way, and he went his And as I looked down the street, I realized the man in the wheelchair was the painter Chuck Close, one of the most famous artists in the whole world, whose work I use all the time. But I was so focused on the puppy dog, I didn't see who the man was at all, literally in front of my eyes. 
Wow. So what I try to get readers to do and participants in my class is to say, what's hiding in plain sight? What is it I'm not seeing? And rather than to add to your burden and say, I need to be noticing more, I encourage you to ask other people. Ask your colleagues. Ask your friends. Here's my situation. Do you think I'm missing anything? Mm, I love that. And, you know, one of the things I've done a decent amount in the past and I'm continuing to do more of is coaching, specifically things like career coaching, a little bit of life coaching. And the biggest value is having somebody who knows how to ask questions, yes. get, get, just get a new thought process, get you to discover a new thought process. That's what it's all about. That and, is. And too often we don't have people who listen and ask with no motive. And I think kind of what you're alluding to there is how we uncover more, having that person. Well, one of the things that I really focus on, I tell people in my class that by about 15 minutes in, they figured out my class is not about finding answers. It's how do you ask questions? Mm. And are you framing questions to elicit the information that you need to do your job effectively? Or are you asking the same old, same old because it worked last time and I'm going to ask the same questions this time? So I really... I try to distinguish between hearing and listening and seeing and observing. They're very different. We hear everything, but we're not always listening. And we see everything, but we're not always observing. And there's a very delicate balance to strike to really um, maximize the information that we can take in. And, you know, it, if you've heard this before, then, well, I'm sure you've heard this before. But for those listening, I would say that, so we interviewed a guy named Richard Weissman a while ago. Have you ever heard uh -huh. of him? No, I haven't. Okay, so he does this. He write, wrote this book, and I don't remember the title, but I, I think it's The Science of Luck. Um, mm -hmm. But he's done a lot of things around luck. And I read this article, this is how I found him, in a magazine where he talked about, really, if you could break luck down into what it is, it's being more observant. Because really, it's you you are in all these situations, but lucky people know how to see them and exploit them. Not exploit them in a bad way, but just, you know, take advantage um, of the the opportunity in that situation. And I think that's one of the things visual intelligence can do for you. I agree with that completely, because when we think about luck, we think about being in the right place at the right time. But <clears throat> I look at it from another side. I think the lucky person avoids being mugged because they're in a situation and their sixth sense tells them, get out. It's because they're observant that they get out of a situation that could actually do them harm. Mm. So it's not just on the fortunate side, they saw a great opportunity that not everybody else would see and they followed it, but they also knew when to extricate themselves and get out of a situation to avoid being harmed either physically or financially or otherwise. Wow. Well, and so again, I just, you know, I can't wait to get in. Let's do it. I'm sure people are like, okay, I get it. Let's learn. So first, tell <laughs> us what is visual intelligence and for the for the whole title of the book just so everyone kind of gets this frame of mind it's visual intelligence sharpen your perception change your life so let's hear more about it okay so visual intelligence the book was a natural outgrowth of the teaching of my program that i've been doing for 14 years and my program is called the art of perception and in a nutshell what the art of perception is is i work with professionals across the spectrum uh, doctors intelligence community law enforcement and basically, I teach them to enhance their observation and perception skills by learning to analyze works of art. And you may say, well, wait a minute, what does being a police officer have to do with looking at works of art? That's the craziest connection I've ever heard. But what I do in the art of perception and the natural outgrowth and visual intelligence is explain that art is a really wonderful set of data. It's new, it's different, and everybody sees something. You can't get into my program and look at a slide and say, well, I don't know because everyone sees something. And the crux of the program is about what you see and how you communicate what you see. So the, what I do, uh, people always call me and they say, oh, come teach us how to see. I can't teach people how to see. You either know how to or you don't. But what I do, the book is broken down into these different chapters. I practice what are called the four A's. Every person, regardless of profession, practices four A's on a new situation, new patient, new client. They assess their situation, they analyze it, they decide what's important, what's not, then they articulate it. They write a report, they send an email, they delegate to the team, and then they adapt their behavior or they act. They make a decision. So you assess, you analyze, you articulate, and you adapt. And so I use art as the vehicle to improve those skills across the professional spectrum. And do you find that it's really understanding the idea and the process as opposed to 
you relating it specifically to their industry. So if they can do it on art and they get the, the why, if you will, or how, they can then go do it? Absolutely. As I said before, I try to connect the dots. So I want their leap back into their professional world to be seamless. Mm. So when they're sitting in my class and, and they come in thinking, what am I going to get out of this? You know, I don't look at art for a living. What is this lady going to teach me? She's not, you know, she's not in the army. She's not a police officer. What am I going to learn? I love to watch that resistance fall away and dissipate because they make the connection. Oh my gosh, she's asking me to ask questions. She's asking me to think about my communication. And that's what I have to do every day. So to, to give this some context and to give it an example, I want to talk about, I think, where it all started, which was in the medical community. Yes. And I read, I forget where I read it, in something, uh, the book or somewhere, that it w- the idea was to observe the patient as opposed to the charts. And right. that struck me for a couple of reasons. One, I've had, like, I've dealt with some things in the past where there you know the chart's not going to show you you need to get in a little bit more and doctors are in my opinion really bad at that or at least the ones i've seen so yep. i want to see how your work has transformed some of them but also i wanted to to get your opinion on we're taught so many of us from an early age that there is a right answer and the answer is found in the data especially as a medical student i would imagine how you know, when somebody comes to you and says, yeah, but the data is here and it's so good. How do you respond in a way that really is right to or makes sense? You know, well, by way of analogy, I'm going to go back to the art museum and then trace it back to medicine. Uh, when I have participants in my class in the art museum, I don't allow them to read the labels next to the work of art. I say to them, look at the work of art first. Tell me what your inherent sense of observation tells you. What are your impressions from looking at the painting? Tell me about them, and then you can read the label. Because what happens is when you read the label, you're going to look for what the label tells you. And the same thing happens in medicine. I tell my medical students, before you pick up the chart, Look at, look, not only look at your patient, but use all five of your senses because perceptions are informed by observations of the five senses, not just the visual. So when you walk into the room, what does the room smell like? What does the patient look like? What does your inherent sense of observation tell you about this patient? Then pick up the chart and see what the night nurse has written. And I had a really wonderful collaborator when I started the program for medical students at the Frick Collection back in 2000. I worked with a physician at Weill Cornell, Dr. Chuck Bardis, and he told me three things. He said when he walks into a patient's room for the first time, he looks at three things. And it takes about 10 seconds. He said, first of all, I look to see if the patient is wearing their own clothing or pajamas or they were wearing a hospital-issued gown. Then I look at the table next to the bed. Are there cards, flowers, balloons? Does this person have an outside connection to the world? And then I look at their facial expression when they walk in the room. Are they happy to see me? Are they relieved to see me? Are they nervous or are they scared? And he said those three observations give me tremendous insight into the patient before I get to their medical condition. And that's what I tell people to do. Just look. And I dare say one of the biggest impediments to just looking is our reliance on digital technology. It's so much easier to look down at your screen and look at your phone and look at your iPod than it is to look at somebody or look around the room at a board meeting. And so even in that example or all the examples that you provide, what what do we do after we simply observe? I think, it, you know, if we leave it at that, people go, OK, I see things, but we have our own cognitive biases and things like that that we're going to perhaps interpret incorrectly. How do we turn observation into visual intelligence? Well, I tell people all the time that you can be the greatest observer in the world, but if your communication skills are substandard, it does you no good at all. (laughs) If you can't communicate what you see at the relevant time and place, it gets stuck in the brain. And I think that part of the reason my, I think my class is resonating with so many people is because something gets lost between what we see and what we say and what we type and what we text. People are using the wrong kind of language to communicate their observations. And so I really work, when I talked about those four A's, I want a bold underscore, you know, and italicize the articulate part because we need to be able to articulate effectively what it is we've assessed and analyzed to get the job done. Wow. I think back to 
you know, as I kind of told you prior to the interview, I do this training for Franklin Covey. And one of the things we talk about is in the knowledge worker age, of course, our brain is the tool that we use the most. And because of that, if we can't articulate what we're thinking or what we solve, then nothing gets done because exactly. it, I mean, if it happens up there, it has to come out somehow and it comes out through verbal and nonverbal cues. Well, I heard a great uh, anecdote. I love to get feedback about the class even months after I've taken it. And I was working with a big multinational corporation and they told me I do these a series of interactive exercises in my class where one person has to look at a work of art that they've never seen before and describe it to their partner who can't see it. And, you know, you don't say who did it. You have to describe exactly what you see and you have one minute to do this. And it sort of gets your mind thinking in a descriptive way. And she said they start their Monday morning staff meetings with that exercise every morning, every Monday. Wow. Just to get people talking and thinking about articulating um, in a more effective way. Now let's take a break for a message from our sponsor, libertarianism.org. Yes, they sponsored our show last week, and we thank them for their support. Always interesting to get a new one on the show and perhaps expand our views. So much political talk is superficial. Just turn on the cable news these days. I really don't want to get too political because of how highly charged of a subject it is. But here's what libertarianism.org has to say. If you're interested in the ideas, philosophy, and history driving our politics, check out libertarianism.org guides. These guides are self-paced online courses taught by professors and experts in their field. In these guides, you'll be introduced to basic ideas and principles of a free and flourishing society, and they can also serve as a path to further learning. These guides include an introduction to political philosophy featuring Jason Brennan and an introduction to libertarianism featuring David Bowes many more to come. Again, you can find these guides on libertarianism.org. I just want to say we thank them for their sponsorship, and it is not necessarily an indication of our personal political views. Again, feel free to visit libertarianism.org. Now let's get back to the show. Wow. Oh my gosh. Out of the blue, that just reminded me, and I'm going to, I need to be quicker. So I'm reading Elon Musk's biography. Yeah. And one of the things he talks about is if you can't give somebody else all of the information they need. So you, you have all of the information inside you, right? And you're making assumptions and you're having conversations based on it. But if you can't give it to somebody else, they are going to come up with different answers and different problems. And he said, so even if you could clone yourself and give that person 90% of the information, they're going to come up with a completely different path, execution, strategy, problems, which really struck me. I mean, because how many times do we give that other person the, all of the information? And that's exactly right. And one of the problems that I face is the reason we have to articulate with clarity, precision, and objectivity, my three favorite words when it comes to communication, is because the point you touched on before that we all see things differently two people can be at the same board meeting, at the same crime scene you know, with the same patient and walk away with fundamentally different perceptions of what they've just observed. And if you can't tell someone exactly what it is that you noticed, and this is the problem, and therefore this is how I want to solve it, then you're going to be going down opposite tracks and you're going to, it's going to be a waste of resources and a waste of time. And that clarity and precision, precision and objectivity is absolutely necessary in communication. And I promise to, to those listening, we're going to get into how to do this, but I think setting up this foundation is really critical. I was wondering, why do we have to learn this? Because evolutionarily speaking, we should be extremely keen observers so for, for danger, you know, for, oh, we've been here before and there was a crocodile that ate my, you know, grandmother or something. I mean, that's kind of morbid, but you know what I'm saying? Like we, we should have evolved to be so aware of what's going on, our surroundings, how to tell others in our village, did we lose it or what's going on there? 
I want to say you're absolutely right that we should all be good at this. But the fact that I've been teaching this class for 14 years Mm -hmm. and I keep getting requests from across the professional spectrum to do this tells me that we're still missing something. And my feeling is that visual intelligence is a work in progress. You never master this because the more we do something and the better we become at it, the more inert we become to our surroundings. Well, I'm good at it. It's worked for 20 years. I'm just going to go with it and not notice the nuances and details of this particular situation. Uh. So visual intelligence, while it's a certain set of skills, one never masters them. You know, I I show a slide of Mount Rushmore while it was being done, uh, while it was being created. And, you know, Mount Rushmore changes every day. The weather wears down, uh, the faces and climate, everything changes. And so visual uh, visual intelligence is, is really work in progress. And it's something, yes, we're good at it and we're getting better, but then we relapse and we think, oh, we're good at it. I'm not going to work on this anymore. It needs to be worked on every day. And I can imagine, as you said, it's situational. So imagine over time, even specifically now with technology, how many different things we're observing. And actually, that reminds me of a question I had for you, which was, I saw that your book was featured in Glamour and under, you know, Year's Best Life Hacks. And then it said, if you want to master your email inbox, basically, read this book. What, what, uh, you know, forgive me if I missed it, but how does your book talk about mastering our email? Well, first of all, I love that people take things from the book that mm-hmm. are going to be most relevant to them and their audiences. And if you had asked me to describe, you know, the salient features of the book, uh, cleaning up your inbox yeah. probably wouldn't have been one of right. them. Right, exactly. But I was fascinated that Glamour took that. And I think the way they applied it, I talk a lot about prioritization of information. And we all have an overflowing inbox. We can get back to it. And then it starts to overwhelm us. I have 100 unanswered emails and I have 500 unread emails. So I think what they took for the book was the idea of prioritization of information. How am I going to tackle this so it doesn't overwhelm me anymore? And it's the idea of sending a one line saying, got your message overwhelmed right now we'll be back to you in a week and then you've read it it's not unread it's not dealt it's not undealt with Mm -hmm. so i think in the context of glamour they were talking about life hacks how to make your life easier what's something you can do i think it comes from prioritization because while a major premise of the book is that no two people uh see the same way another premise is that no two people prioritize the same way and if we step back and think about how we prioritize information that can probably clarify help clarify our situations as well oh my gosh and you just reminded me there's this amazing video i i want it's not college humor but it's something similar and a guy says he wanted to create an email response that's simply the okay sign mm-hmm. and it's just that like okay i got it thanks you know, it was great. Maybe, maybe I'll get back to you, but maybe just relax. Yeah, so true. One of my true. favorite subject lines that I've seen and that I've gotten my friends and colleagues to use is uh, NRN. You know what that means? No idea. No reply needed. Oh. And so it's purely informational. Someone sends it to you and basically they said, you know what? Read this and you can delete it. You do not have to get back to me. I love that. Yeah, because it's so it's one of those things. I mean, if somebody doesn't respond to you, first of all, if they don't respond quickly, second of all, if they don't respond at all, people take it can take it very personally. Yes, and, they do. But then they do the same thing, right? It's we it, all do it. Yeah, I don't know. Because we are barraged with information, and I think one of the takeaways of this book is not only barraged with visual information, but uh, hearing and thinking and news and Twitter feeds and how do we negotiate all this information and extract from it what we need not only to run our lives but to do our jobs as effectively as possible. Well, that's a good lead in. Let's take the next 15 minutes or so as much as we can cram in because, you know, we have a whole book here and I, <laughs> I definitely recommend people or they probably listen like I got to check this out. But how do we get more visually intelligent? What's the first step? The first step, I think, is to recognize, to say to yourself, you know what, I have something to learn here. Because if you start off by, I'll give you an example. 
Uh, at the opening of my class, I show a photograph and I ask people to put their hands up in the air and they can only put their hands down when they see something definitive and unequivocal in the picture. And very few people see it. You know, some people put their hands down right away, but very, very few. And then I tell them that there's a mammal in the picture. And if they see a mammal definitive and definitively and unequivocally, they can put their hands down. A few more hands go down. And finally, I say, you're looking at a four-legged mammal. You know, if you see a four-legged mammal here, you can put your hand down. The majority of the hands are still up in the room. When I reveal what's in the picture, and I'm not going to reveal it because it's in the book and mm -hmm. I don't want to give it away. Mm -hmm. When I finally reveal what's in the picture, most people have this aha moment and they say, oh my gosh, how did I not see that? It was hiding right in plain sight in front of me. How did I not see it? In all my years of teaching, I had one person cross his arms and he said, I'm not going to listen to anything else you have to say because you're trying to trick me. <laughs> and I said, you know, with all due respect, I'm not trying to trick you. I'm just trying to show you that there's more than one way to see everything. And you happen to be in sales. And I think it would behoove you to understand that your clients may see things very differently than you do. And he said, nope, you're trying to trick me. I'm not going to go through this. Hmm. And he put up this wall of skepticism and his colleagues were really quite disparaging towards him. But the first step, I think, in increasing our visual intelligence is opening our eyes and saying, you know what, there's stuff out there that I'm missing and I need to broaden my vision. Well, I think that's probably one of the hardest steps. We always talk about, like when I'm doing corporate training, we're going to be talking about mindset, skill set, and tool set. And if you can change your mindset, you can figure out the other two. Absolutely. So, so Absolutely. you know, for this, it's like, guys, you're missing some things. Once you get there... What do we do next? Because I just look at it as such a tough topic. Well, you know, observe more, think critically, figure out what's going on, ask others. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I can't fit all this into my day. So, exactly. I'm, you know, I'm asking for like a Cliff Notes to, you know, version to be more intelligent via observation. Right, right. Well, the last thing I want to do, everybody I work with is busy. You know, everybody I work with has no time. So the last thing I want to do is burden people with one more thing to think about. And my, my goal, I guess my ultimate goal is to make visual intelligence, or I should say expanding your visual intelligence more um, automatic, that I want you to think about this without thinking about it. So I tell people, I mean, here I am in New York City, and we have a built-in mechanism to enhance your visual observation skills. Just look on the street. When you're on the subway, you know, cops always told me, when you're on the subway, every time the doors open, you should see who gets on and who gets off. Hmm. What do you notice around you? Who's sitting next to you? What are they wearing? What do they smell like? Could you tell someone when you get off the subway, could you uh, identify a witness who was standing next to you? So it's the idea of looking around you and making a conscious effort to look up from your digital technology. And in no way am I suggesting giving up your digital technology because we all use it all the time, but to be more aware of your surroundings. Uh, you know, my son and I play this game. It's called Trivia. What did you observe? The poor child lives and breathes the art of perception. <laughs> but whenever we're in a restaurant and the waiter or waitress takes our order, n without fail, after they take the order and walk away, he says, Trivia, Trivia, what was the name of the waiter? Uh... And, you know, it's small details like that. You may say, well, I don't need to know the name of the waiter. No, but you need to know the wife, the name of the wife of your client. Mm-hmm. And you need to know how many children your client has. And you need to know how many times the patient has come into the hospital with congestive heart failure in the last six months. So the same way of looking at art, no, you don't need to tell me, you know, everything George Washington is wearing in that portrait. But you need to be able to tell me that you noticed a rainbow in the upper right hand corner. So it's about being more observant of your immediate surroundings. So then when you're in, a, in an important situation and a professional situation, you transfer those skills readily and seamlessly. I was just I actually was picturing visualizing that that image, the, the George Washington and the rainbow you were talking about, just because I would I would miss that rainbow. Um, one of the things I would imagine you see a lot or run into is the fact that we aren't as observant as perhaps we could be or should be, however you want to look at it, is because we are so inwardly focused. Yes. Do you, do you talk about that? Do people have to address that? Yes. I have to address it all the time because I quite simply say, you know what? It's not all about you all the time. Mm -hmm. And we are inwardly focused, and I keep coming back to this, our digital technology 
only compounds the problem because it's it's our focus on our phones and on our screens and on our Facebook page and our Twitter page. And it's one of the things that I really concentrate on. It's not just about I see, I notice, I did. It's about self-perception. We need to be aware. How do people see us? Do your colleagues know not to talk to you before your third cup of coffee? Do you send emails in all capital letters all the time? And how annoying is that? (laughs) You need to know how you come across. I always say that self-perception is critical for professional development. So the idea of looking at art, it's self-reflective also. How do I see this? What does this remind me of? What are my associations? Not just what I see, but how do people see me? And for anyone out there who's thinking, well, I don't know how this necessarily relates to me or if I can make it more a part of my life. It really, you brought up this story for me. One of the, my first friends when I moved here, I was about 10. Uh, I remember I went out to dinner with him and his family and his dad was very, uh, he was like, I, I'm sitting right there in that chair. Okay. So then maybe a few weeks later we do it again and I'm sitting in a chair and he was, you know, I'm young. He's like, get up. I'm sitting there. And eventually I realized as I became better friends, he's a lifelong secret service agent protecting vice presidents, Al Gore, all this. And he was conditioned to looking at the entryway. That was his thing. And it was such a part of his routine. Think yeah. about think about how much more perceptive he was because he focused on it for so long. And I think that's kind of one of the things you're alluding to here. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we we get into this routine of what our vantage point is. And when it changes, it rocks our world. Mm. You know, when he said to you, I sit there, yeah. Yeah. you know, there was no question that you were going to get up or whoever was there <laughs> yeah. and he was going to sit down. But one of the things that I try to talk about, and we spoke about this before, is flexibility. Mm-hmm. To have flexibility and not lose your bearing. Now, of course, when you're a police officer, and you know, I, I had a similar experience. I've been on the beat with cops for years. I go out with them on the street, and sometimes I'll have to remind them that I need lunch because they seem to be able to go hours without eating. So we went into a local pizza parlor, and we sat down, and they did the same thing. No, Amy, you sit over here. We sit there because they have to be looking outside all the time. Their backs can't be to the window and to the door. And... So we need to be flexible in the workplace. We need to be flexible in home. And as I said to you earlier, it makes life easier for everyone when we can roll with it and not lose our edge, not lose our ability to observe. You know, those professionals, they have to be looking. But for the rest of us, we should be able to transfer those observation skills and be flexible in what we do because I think it makes us more efficient as professionals and as people. Absolutely. And so what do, you, what do you say to the person who goes, okay, I understand that I'm missing some things and I'm going to start being more observant, but, and perhaps this is a question directly from me. I mean, I'm thinking this is, you know, how do I see what I'm missing because I'm missing it? You know what I mean? Like that's the whole okay. thing behind cognitive bias, I think, is we don't even know we're missing it. Right. And so you say to yourself, well, how do I know what I don't know? Right. There you go. So when you ask yourself, uh, I give my my students this three-prong model for every new client, every new situation, every new problem. You ask three questions. You say, number one, what do I definitively know about the situation? Number two, what don't I know? And you say, well, how do I know what I don't know? But you can begin to identify what's missing from the situation. And number three, if I had the opportunity to get more information, what do I need to know? So what are the holes that I need to fill? So when people don't, you know, when you have to identify what's missing, You say to yourself, well, I see this situation. It's very disturbing. What are the missing pieces here? Is this person in trouble or do they just look emotional because they're talking on the phone? What don't I know here? Are they talking to somebody? Have they been helped? And then when you identify what could be missing, it helps you frame the questions to try to help people. There's a Uh, something I write about in the book, my editor actually, after reading the manuscript, used the art of perception, used the methodology to save someone's life on the subway in New York. He noticed that someone was having trouble breathing and she was coughing and coughing and reaching through her purse. And he said he went through the methodology of what do I know here? What can I identify? And even though he didn't know what was wrong with her, that was definitely missing. He knew she was in trouble. And the other passengers, it's not that they didn't give a damn what was happening. They didn't know how to analyze the information. So at the next stop, 
He went up to the conductor in the train and he identified the car immediately. He said, we have a sick passenger. You need to take the train out of service and get emergency personnel. He knew there was trouble because she was looking in her bag and he came to the inference that she needed an asthma inhaler. Wow. Because she was frantically searching for something and coughing. And most people looked around and said, yeah, the lady's having a hard time. Well, they took the train out of service. EMS people came, put her, gave her oxygen and got her out of the train. Wow. And he wrote about it. We put it in the book because he said before reading visual intelligence, it's not that I wouldn't have cared. I just wouldn't have, wouldn't have had the set of tools to be able to do something. And even though he didn't have complete information, he didn't know what was wrong, he could, he could put his communication skills together in such a way that he could communicate to the conductor that there was a problem. Hmm. So that's how it can be used. And, and that, I could, I mean, that, that can happen in everyday life. How do you translate this to business? I know you do a lot of Fortune 500. Uh, you have a lot of clients and you do speaking for them. I mean, again, if I wanted to be a, a, a terrible interviewer, I could guess how you do it. I'm sure everyone has a number of guesses. But really, what is seems to be the most pertinent when you're dealing with kind of for-profit companies and how to be more observant? A couple of things that I really emphasize in for-profit companies. The first one is... Being able, as we talk about, seems to be a common thread, uh, seeing what's there, but also what I call the pertinent negative, seeing what's not there. And when you're talking about forecasting trends, if you're thinking about gathering data, if you're looking at the markets and you have to forecast trends, you need to evaluate not only what you see, but what you don't see. The pertinent negative is being able to articulate what's not there. What omissions are you noticing? And how do you delegate that to your teams to help them see what other people don't see? So in that for-profit context, we're talking about information, evaluating, gathering data, and then distilling that data down into a format that you can de delegate to your team in vision and in strategy for a company. So it's about reevaluating ways of thinking, revising what you currently believe, and distilling information to help you and your teams to see what needs to be seen in the marketplace and communicate it more effectively. And often with these for-profit for companies, they have to do this across cultural landscapes. You know, they're multiple mm. multinational corporations and they need to recognize what their biases are and be able to communicate effectively across the cultural landscape. Well, I mean, I can see how this information really can translate to so many aspects of our lives, different professions. Uh, you know, I, I, again, really recommend those of you listening, check out the book, Visual Intelligence, see maybe how it can help you out and, uh, and reach out to Amy, which we will, we'll get some information on how to do that. Well, Amy, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I know you're busy right now. I saw your, your book tour. Looks like you're all over the place. I am all over the place. It's going to be a busy <laughs> couple of weeks, but I'm enjoying every minute of it. And if, you know what, for those listening, they might want, they might be in these city, all, cities. I'll run down real quick. Uh, Seattle on May 18th, San Francisco, May 19th, San Antonio, May 23rd, Boston, May 25th and 26th, Princeton, June 6th and 7th. Annapolis, June 20th and 24th, Chicago, June 30th, and I'm seeing you're back in D.C. on June 16th. Yes, and if anybody can't make those cities and wants to contact me with any questions or read more about the art of perception of visual intelligence, they can go to my website at www.artfulperception.com. Artfulperception.com. Where uh, do, Are you on social or do you write other places, anything like that? Um, we are on Twitter and we're almost on Facebook with the book, so we're going to be yeah. out there. Okay. You know, it's funny. I was thinking this the other day. I was listening to a podcast and they say, you know, tell us where you are. And I think soon it's just going to be like, here's my name. Type it into Google. That's it. I am, so, I am so out there on Google. If you type in Amy Herman, Art of Perception or Visual Intelligence, you will find me. You'll find her. So that's where to go. The, Amy, thank you again so much. Excellent. It's really been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thanks again. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. All righty. Bye-bye. All right. Welcome back from the show. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Amy Herman. You guys might be thinking, Chris, we've heard enough from you. Where's John? At least he normally gives us the outro. 
Well, funny enough, John just moved. Congratulations on the new place there, buddy. Um, but his internet company is on strike. Seriously, like legit strike. I'm not going to go ahead and name names. <coughs> cough, Verizon. Cough. <coughs> um, but they were unable to get to his house. So he doesn't have internet. He can't set up the podcast, all this stuff. At least he can go to work and do the editing and get it posted. Anyway, if you've stuck around through this diatribe, thanks so much. Remember to sign up for the newsletter, smartpeoplepodcast.com, bottom right-hand corner. And reach out to us on Twitter. We're at smartpeoplepod. John monitors that most of the time, so that's how you can get in touch with him. I listen to it and see what he says and let him have his fun. Hope you guys are having a great week, day, year, wherever you may be. Look forward to catching you next week on Smart People Podcast. See you later. Thank you again to our sponsor today, Libertarianism.org. Libertarianism.org has self-paced online courses about free and flourishing societies. They're called Libertarianism.org Guides. Libertarianism.org Guides feature expert insights from top professors. Whether you're encountering ideas for a free and flourishing society for the first time or want to explore it more, Libertarianism.org Guides will help you get your footing. <laughs>